குட் ஈவினிங் எஸ்பிரன்ஸ் வெல்கம் டு டெய்லி நியூஸ் அனாலிசிஸ் பை சங்கர் ஏஸ் அகாடமி டுடே ஸ்டேட் இஸ் டுவெண்ட்டி சிக்ஸ்த் செப்டம்பர் டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி த்ரீ டிஸ்பிளேட் ஹியர் ஆர் த லிஸ்ட் ஆஃப் டாபிக்ஸ் வி ஆர் கோயிங் டு சி டுடே நான் வித்வுட் வெஸ்டிங் எனி டைம் லெட் அஸ் கெட் இன் டு த டிஸ்கஷன் லுக் அட் திஸ் எடிட்டோரியல் ஆர்டிக்கல் த எடிட்டோரியல் ஹியர் இஸ் அபவுட் ரீசெண்ட்லி கன்க்ளூடட் ஜி டுவெண்ட்டி சமிட் த ஆத்தர் ஆஃப் த எடிட்டோரியல் ஹைலைட்ஸ் வேரியஸ் பாசிட்டிவ் அவுட் கம்ஸ் ஆஃப் ஜி டுவெண்ட்டி சமிட் த ஆத்தர் ஆல்சோ கமெண்ட்ஸ் அபவுட் polarization of world and how the room for non alignment is shrinking day by day so this is about the news article for this discussion i plan on doing something different see usually we discuss the important points from editorial and finally we display the model mains question but today i will first display the mains question and then we will discuss how to approach the question and also how to use the points from editorial in your answer So this is the plan for today's discussion. Before getting into discussion, let us look into the syllabus. In mains it comes under GS paper 2 under the topic of global groupings and agreement involving India or affecting India's interest. Now let us start the discussion. First look at this question. The recently held G20 summit helped transform India's position in global politics. Comment. So this is the question we are going to answer today. the key word here is comment now what should we do when the question contains a key word comment if you see the word comment it means the examiner is asking you to provide your own thoughts opinions or insights into the particular topic to support your opinion you must provide supporting evidence or examples whenever possible now how to approach this specific question the question says that The recently held G20 summit helped transform India's position in global politics. So in the introduction part you have to write some points about G20 Delhi summit. The main body of answer can be split into two parts. In first part you can write some points supporting the statement and in the second part you can write some points about counter arguments to the statement. In conclusion part you have to take a balanced stand. So this is how you approach this question. Now let us start with the introduction. In introduction I have already mentioned that you can write some points about G20 in general and few points about Delhi summit. For example you can state the following facts about G20. G20 is a group of 20 countries which was formed in the year 1999. It was formed to address global financial crisis faced during the period of 1997 to 1999 it was only in 2008 g20 was upgraded to a summit level forum so this is due to the global financial crisis of 2008 the term summit level forum in this context refers to meeting of head of the state or governments for the purpose of diplomatic negotiations and in the introduction you can also write some points about delhi summit For example you can state this fact India is hosting the G20 summit for first time in 2002 India hosted G20 meeting before it was raised to summit level forum you can mention the theme of 2023 summit which is vasudeva kudumbakam you can also mention about new delhi declaration that was adopted during the recent summit so these are the important points which you can add in the introduction part Now coming to the body of the answer. In this we have to provide various points supporting the statement that is the statement provided in the question. For this we can take the points from today's news editorial. The first one is regarding Russia Ukraine war. New Delhi G20 leadership declaration called upon peace in Ukraine. The New Delhi declaration was different from 2022 Bali declaration of G20. So the difference between the two declaration is that Bali declaration heavily criticized Russia's action in Ukraine but the New Delhi declaration instead of accusing Russia's action it sought for a resolution to the conflict the New Delhi declaration received 100% consensus from all member nations even Russia and China also agreed to the declaration getting 100% consensus is a diplomatic victory for india this diplomatic victory 
will help transform India's position in global politics. Then you can mention about admission of African Union into G20. African Union was admitted as a permanent member in G20 to increase the representation of Africa in G20 forum. India played an important role in the admission of African Union into G20. So this will also help transform India's position in global politics. Then you can mention about reforming multilateral development banks through G20 forum. In New Delhi declaration, India highlighted the importance of reforming multilateral development banks. Examples of the multilateral development banks are IMF and World Bank. Through this, India gave a voice to Global South. Then you can mention about Global Biofuel Alliance. This Global Biofuel Alliance is an India-led initiative that aims to promote adoption of biofuels. It aims to place biofuels as the next stage of energy transition. This Global Biofuel Alliance will help to mitigate climate change for some extent. Then you can also say various steps taken by India as a part of G20 summit to ensure food security. Here you can mention about India giving its voice for timely implementation of Black Sea Grain Initiative. You can also mention about G20 high level principles on food security and nutrition and also about millet initiative called Maharishi. So these are important steps which India participated to ensure global food security. Finally, you can mention the steps taken to prevent diversion of small arms and light weapons for terrorist activities. The last year, G20 Bali declaration only focused on financing of terrorism and strengthening of FATF, that is Financial Action Task Force. But this year's New Delhi Declaration seeks to address wide range of concerns. It clearly condemned terrorism in all forms and manifestations. So New Delhi Declaration is basically wider and larger than Bali Declaration that happened in last year's summit. So clearly through Delhi summit, India addressed all major concerns like increasing geopolitical polarization, voicing the needs of developing world, climate change, food security and terrorism. So we can say that Delhi G20 summit helped transform India's position in global politics. But there are some issues as well. You have to write about the issue in second part of the answer. In this you can mention about India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor IMEC. This project clearly counters China's Belt and Road Initiative and surely it will anger China. China even mentioned that IMEC should not become a geopolitical tool. So this shows that India failed to balance between India's regional needs and global ambitions. Then you can also mention that India failed to address the rift between West and Russia. The US is strengthening its position by including non-NATO states into NATO. Russia for its part is also deepening its ties with China, North Korea, Iran, Turkey and other African countries. So this resulted in a more polarized world as it existed during Cold War. India could have used the G20 summit to bring consensus between the two sides that is the West and Russia but it failed. So you can write these two points as a counter argument to the statement given in the question. Since it is a 10 mark question these 8 points are sufficient. Now coming to the conclusion part. In conclusion, you can take a balanced position. You can mention that although Delhi G20 summit has largely helped India transform its position, a lot has to be done before India becomes a true superpower. This is how you have to approach the question and use the points from editorial in your answer. See through this discussion, on one hand we covered the points mentioned in the editorial, on other hand we also discussed how to approach the question and generate points. We are planning to do this procedure more often. So please mention in comment section your thoughts on this discussion. You just mention whether we have to continue following the traditional approach of covering the editorial or we have to follow this new approach. Based on your feedback, we will try and revamp our program. That is all regarding this discussion. 
Now let us move to the next topic. Look at this news article. Recently, 5th World Coffee Conference held for first time in Asia in Bangalore. In that conference, Piyush Goyal, the Union Minister of Commerce and Industries, told that coffee is an international commodity. It also acts as a unifying force to bring cultures, countries and colors together. So in this context, let us see about coffee from prelims perspective. See, coffee is a tropical plantation crop. Its seeds are roasted, grounded and are used as beverage. Now let us see the geographical conditions required for coffee growth. Firstly, coffee needs warm and wet climate. Secondly, a well-drained loamy soil is good for coffee plantation. The soil should be rich in humus and minerals like iron and calcium. The temperature range should be between 15 degrees Celsius and 28 degrees Celsius. And the rainfall range should be 150 to 250 centimeter which is necessary for coffee growth. Coffee is generally grown under shady trees. The conditions like frost, snowfall, temperature above 30 degrees Celsius are not good for coffee growth. Moreover, coffee requires dry weather at the time of ripening of berries. Actually, coffee is grown on hill slopes at a height of 600 to 1600 meters above mean sea level. So these are the basics of coffee plantation. Now let us see the varieties of coffee. There were three varieties of coffee, Arabica, Robusta and Liberica. Out of these three varieties, India mostly grows Arabica and Robusta. Here, Arabica is a superior quality of coffee. Now let us see the distribution of coffee plantations in India. Coffee is mostly grown in Western Ghats in Karnataka, Kerala and Tamil Nadu. Here, Karnataka alone cultivates more than two-thirds of coffee grown in the country. See the distribution here. Karnataka has 54% of coffee plantation. Kerala has 19%, Tamil Nadu has 8%. Nowadays, even in non-traditional areas like Andhra Pradesh, Odisha and Northeastern states, the coffee is cultivated. Interestingly, India is the only country in the world where the entire coffee cultivation is grown under shade, hand-picked and sun-dried. Because of this only, our coffee is highly valued in world market and is sold as premium coffee in Europe. Now let us see about the Coffee Board. Coffee Board was established under Coffee Act of 1942. It is headquartered in Bangalore. This Coffee Board comes under the control of Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Until 1995, the marketing of coffee was done by Coffee Board. But after the liberalization reforms, the Coffee Board lost its importance in coffee sector. It mainly conducts research and development transfer of technology, enhancement of production, quality improvement, export promotion and supporting the development of domestic coffee market. So this is about Coffee Board of India. So this is all about this discussion. Let us move to the next topic. Take a look at this front page article. This is about China-Tibet issue. Dalai Lama has said that Tibetans are only asking for more autonomy and not for political separation. He also said that he is ready to talk to China regarding Tibetan issue. Know that Dalai Lama is a spiritual leader of Tibetan Buddhism and he also served as political leader of Tibetan government in exile. So in our discussion today, we shall see about Tibetan issue and India's stand on this issue. Before that, the syllabus regarding this discussion is given here. You can take a look at it. Let's begin with the location of Tibet. See, Tibet is located to the northwest of India also bordering China, Nepal, Myanmar and Bhutan. Before 1951, Tibet has a theocratic government in which Dalai Lama was a religious head and also the political leader. Here, theocratic government means a government that is run by religious leader based on the rules of religion. In case of Tibet, the Buddhist rulers named Dalai Lama ruled the country since 1391 AD. All through history, Tibet has been a buffer zone between China and India. But during the colonial era, British government expanded into Himalayan region and created tensions between India and China. In 1914, the British signed Simla Convention with Tibet. 
this convention established the borders between Tibet and British India. Later in 1949, when Communist Party took over China, they refused this Shimla Convention and the borders that are created by it. So this is the origin of India-China border issue. In 1950, the People's Liberation Army of China invaded Tibet, asserting that Tibet was part of China's territory. In 1959, Dalai Lama started an uprising against Chinese rule in Lhasa, the capital of Tibet. But this uprising became a failure and was brutally struck down by Chinese army. So Dalai Lama, along with the thousands of Tibetan refugees, fled to India. Indian government accommodated them in Dharmashala in Himachal Pradesh. So with this information, now let us see about India's Tibet policy. India officially recognizes Tibet as an autonomous region of China, and India also approves one China policy of China. This means that India does not support Tibetan independence or challenge China's sovereignty over Tibet. The Central Tibetan Administration, also known as Tibetan Government in Exile, was established in Dharmashala by Dalai Lama. It represents the Tibetan diaspora and advocate for Tibetan rights. Dalai Lama renounced his political authority in 2011, and since then he remains only as a religious head. Dalai Lama continues to promote Tibetan Buddhism and its culture from India, and India supported Tibetan cultural and religious practices, allowing Tibetan monasteries and cultural institutions to thrive in India. So, India's support for Tibetan exile community has been a consistent feature of its Tibet policy. India's position is to seek a peaceful resolution to Tibet issue. through dialogue between chinese government and tibetan leadership india china border dispute particularly in the region of akshay chin remains a contentious issue the tibetan issue is also connected to this dispute and it makes india's tibetan policy more complex as india china tensions grow and turn violent after galwan valley clash china has began to raise tibetan militia groups Further, Indian Army also trains Tibetan Special Frontier Force. So this could lead to Tibetans fighting each other in future. So in conclusion, Dalai Lama and Tibet is one of the major irritants between India and China relations. So this is all about this discussion. Now let us move to the next topic. Look at this news article. Recently, Parliament Standing Committee on Education submitted a report called. implementation on national education policy 2020 in higher education this report is submitted in parliament recently it analyzed salient features of national education policy in higher education and the progress made in achieving the objectives so in this discussion let us see the criticisms of national education policy from our main exam perspective Firstly the national education policy was announced without a proper consultation with the states that is it was announced in a top to down manner recent data from parliamentary standing committee states that out of 1043 universities functioning in the country 70 percentage comes under the states act it also says that 94 percentage of students are in state or private institutions with just 6% of students in central higher educational institutions so from this we can understand states are major stakeholder in policy making and not getting their consent is a major drawback of this policy secondly national education policy aims to increase the public expenditure from 4.43% to 6% of gdp while it is a good idea to improve the infrastructure of education We do not know how this increased expenditure will be shared between central and state governments. So this is an another concern regarding national education policy. Thirdly, NEP aims to make mother tongue as a medium of instruction up to the class of five. It also proposes that reading and writing skills in other languages will be taught in grade three and beyond. This is a double-edged sword. because it aims to increase the mother tongue based education and at the same time a shift towards mother tongue 
has implications especially for marginalized and rural children this is especially a concern in india where english is widely associated with employability and privilege fourthly it mentions the implementation of three language formula so the states are given autonomy to decide on the languages which are taught but there is a condition that they should be native to india this policy decision will go against two language formula of states like tamil nadu next the indian institutions will face several issues in implementing the multiple entry and multiple exist system meme system here the meme system is an educational approach that allows students in higher education to enter and exist their academic programs at various points so this might look like a flexible system which is efficient in western universities but it might not work well in countries like india it would be very difficult for colleges to predict how many students would enter and exist so it will disturb the pupil to teacher ratio an important concern of meme is that it may encourage the mid term drop out of students with a diploma than pursuing engineering it will seriously affect the future of students and it may also affect their future job prospects so this is a concern about meme system lastly the national education policy might lead to privatization of higher education which is dangerous to the idea of social justice see the nep aims to gradually phase out the system of affiliation to a university in 15 years and grant autonomy to colleges which will open the doors to privatization so these are the important concerns of national education policy so this is all about this topic now let us move to the next part of our discussion look at this news article it speaks about bilateral talks held between external affairs minister jay shankar and un secretary general antonio guterres that is held on monday in this meeting they discussed about the need for reforming international financial institutions and their sustainability agenda so in this context let us see the problems with global financial institutions and the steps that are need to be taken to reform them first let us see the problems associated with global financial institutions the first major concern is under representation of developing countries in managing these global financial institutions see the world bank president is a us citizen and he is always appointed by us president and the imf managing director is a european union national appointed by european commission so here there are no proper representation from developing countries like india and china so this is a major concern of international financial institutions like world bank and imf the next is these institutions do not keep up pace with global growth for example world bank has 22 billion in paid up capital and this will be used for low interest loans and grants for development programs around the world but the concern is this money as a percentage of global gdp is less than 1/5th of 1960 level thirdly the world bank is often criticized as spreading agenda of world capitalism for example if you take structural adjustment program sap by world bank here the sap means a free market policy reforms that are imposed on developing countries by world bank as a condition for receiving loans so many critics accuse that sap policies have increased the gap between rich and poor in many developing countries the un secretary general recently accused the response of imf and world bank to covid-19 pandemic as a glaring failure un secretary general also said in a recent interview that sense of bias and injustice is inherently present in current international financial architecture this is because such institutions was established when many developing countries were still under the colonial rule many regional financial institutions like brics bank asian infrastructure investment bank asian development bank are created to meet the aspirations of developing nations so let us see the steps taken to ensure the reforms in multilateral financial institutions first is imf quota reforms these are created 
to ensure the voting rights of developed countries in IMF. The leaders of global financial institutions are open to all countries as this will increase the credibility of institutions. The resource base of global financial institutions should be regularly increased by global cooperation to ensure the loans provided to developing nations. So these are the steps that need to be taken to reform the global institutions like IMF and World Bank. So this is all regarding this discussion. Now let us move to the next topic. Have a look at this news article. It says that ISRO has successfully tested CE-20 engine that is to be used for Gaganyaan mission. This CE-20 engine will power the cryogenic upper stage of Gaganyaan mission. So this is about the news article. In this context, let us see important points about Gaganyaan mission. The Gaganyaan mission is India's ambitious human space flight program. The mission aims to send Indian astronauts also known as Vayumnauts into space. This is basically a technology demonstration mission. Through this mission, ISRO aims to demonstrate human spaceflight capability by launching a crew of three members to the orbit of 400 km for a three days mission. Launch vehicle Mark 3 that is LVM3 will be used to launch this Gaganyaan mission. Now let us see the important components of this mission. The first one is orbital module. This orbital module will comprise a crew module and a service module. The crew module is habitable space with earth-like environment in the space for the crew members. It has human-centric products, life support system, avionics and deceleration systems. It is also designed for re-entry to ensure safety of the crew during the return of mission. The service model will be used for providing necessary support to the crew module while it is in orbit. It contains thermal system, propulsion system, power systems and deployment mechanisms. It remains attached to the crew module until the mission's end. So this crew module and service module are the important components of this mission. Now let us see the significance of the mission. Firstly, it will demonstrate human space flight capabilities. This in turn will lay foundation for sustained human space exploration for India. Secondly, the mission will help in employment generation and resource development in advanced science and research and development activities. Thirdly, in future missions, scientists can conduct experiments in microgravity including biology, material science and astronomy. Then the mission will technically help India for future collaborations in global space station development. It will also motivate our youth to study and choose a career in space science. Finally, the mission will strengthen international partnership and global security through sharing of peaceful goals. So these are some of the significance of the mission. So this is all regarding this discussion. Now let us move to the next topic. Now we have come to the prelims practice question discussion. Look at the first question. Consider the following statements about cultivation of coffee. Look at the first statement. It requires warm and wet climate with a temperature range of 15 to 25 degrees Celsius. Yes, this statement is correct. The marketing of coffee in India is spearheaded by Coffee Board of India. This statement is incorrect because the marketing of coffee is privatized after LPG reforms of 1991. Look at the third statement. Stagnant water is necessary for enrichment of aroma of the crop. This statement is incorrect because the stagnant water damages the coffee crop. So the correct answer is option A. One pair only. Now look at the second question. Rapid financing instrument and rapid credit facility are related to the provisions of lending by which one of the following institution? The correct answer is option B. International Monetary Fund. So the rapid financing instrument and rapid credit facility are related to International Monetary Fund. Now look at the third question. Consider the following statements about LVM3 that is launch vehicle Mark 3. Look at the first statement. It is a three stage launch vehicle with a solid stage, liquid stage and a cryogenic upper stage. Yes, this statement is correct. The cryogenic upper stage is powered by CE20, India's largest cryogenic engine. 
Yes, the statement is also correct. CE20 is the India's largest cryogenic engine which we have seen in the news today. Look at the third statement. LVM3 is capable of placing 8000 kg payload in geostationary orbit. This statement is incorrect. LVM3 is only capable of placing this much weight in lower earth orbit and not in geostationary orbit. See, LVM3 is capable of placing 4000 kg payload in geostationary orbit. So the correct answer is option B, only 2. So these are the main questions for you today. Interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in comment section. With this, we have come to the end of the discussion. If you like the video, please share it with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you.